Um, because we are right now in a breakout session, we're a little bit smaller group. If folks would move up a bit, we can have more of a conversation. Um, I personally am very excited about this breakout session. Um, this is clean water, clean elections, and talking about how the environment and fair courts are linked. So I am going to turn it right over to your moderator, Billy Corrier from Center for American Progress. Thank Welcome. you. Um, Oops, thank you, Deborah. Um, as Deborah said, I'm Billy Corrier with the Center for American Progress. Um, Oh, wherever you like. Um, and I'm going to take a few minutes to briefly introduce our panelists. Um, we've got a lot of folks on stage, so I'm going to try and keep it brief. Um, we've got uh, here to my left, uh, Professor John Echeverria from Vermont Law School. Um, he teaches a range of environmental law courses and property. Um, and before that, he was the executive director of the Georgetown Environmental Law and Policy Institute. Um, he has written extensively on the intersection of the environment and money in judicial elections, and he's going to tell us a little bit about his research today. Um, and then to his left, we have Chris Crom from the Institute for Southern Studies. Um, he's been there since 1997. Um, the Institute is an essential resource for grassroots activists, community leaders, and policymakers throughout the South. Um, and they, uh, Chris is also the publisher of the Facing South blog, which does really great investigative reporting. Um, and uh, he, they also published uh, followncmoney.org, which is a website that tracks um, all the spending, including outside spending, in uh, North Carolina elections. Um, and then to his left, we've got um, Jacqueline Patterson from the NAACP Environmental and Climate Justice Program. Uh, the Climate Justice Program promotes policies on issues like clean energy, transportation equity, um, food justice, equity and development, and many, many other issues. Um, and lately, Jacqueline, uh, in addition to a lot of other states, she's been organizing in North Carolina, um, and she's going to tell us a little bit about uh, what's going on there. And then last but not least, we have Katherine Terser. Um, she's a policy analyst with Common Cause Ohio, where she works on a broad range of issues, uh, mostly relating to money and politics or voting rights. Um, Common Cause Ohio works to hold elected officials, officials accountable. Katherine has written extensively on money and politics issues and the need for reform. Um, she also served on a on a commission uh, that was put together by former Ohio Chief Justice Thomas Moyer on uh, reforming judicial elections in Ohio. So um, please give me a hand in welcoming the panel. And to get started, I'd like to play a short five-minute video that we produced at the Center for American Progress. Um, it's about uh, the intersection of money in judicial elections and coal ash pollution in North Carolina. Um, and we'd like to play that now and then we'll have a we'll have a discussion the hardest moments for me is when I'm laying awake in the middle of the night and I'm thinking about all the times I made a pitcher of Kool-Aid with the water or I boiled a pot of corn or potatoes with the water. Those thoughts just stick with me in the middle of the night. And I feel horrible as a mom that I didn't know that something was wrong, but how could I have known? There's no way I would have known. The spill at Dan River happened when a drainage pipe that ran underneath an ash basin and dam collapsed sucking out six decades of waste and spewing gunk directly into the river. My husband and I just kind of looked at each other like, hmm, should we be concerned? We live right next to an ash pond and this was coal ash spilling into the Dan River. And we learned at that point all of the toxins that were included in coal ash. A situation like Dan River, where there was a catastrophic disaster, gets people's attention. But the fact is that these coal ash pits have been leaking and poisoning people's groundwater and the state surface waters for decades. Coal ash is the residue left behind after coal is burned in a coal-fired power plant. A large coal-fired power plant can burn 10 million tons of coal a year. When, that, when the organic matter in the coal is burned away, what's left behind are these trace minerals, things like arsenic 
lead, mercury, selenium, and chromium. Uh, and these are highly concentrated. The coal ash can have concentrations of these contaminants that are 10 to 100 times greater than the level in the coals themselves. Coal ash pond number one is right behind my house, literally pretty much in my backyard. We were approached by a neighbor who was wanting to have their well tested and we decided that maybe we should have ours tested as well. They found hexavalent chromium at um, 4.5 parts per billion. So in talking to the residents, um, we have discovered anecdotal evidence of an extraordinary number of cancers for this, this fairly small community. Some of us in the community got together, we started kind of talking about all the cancer that we've seen in our, some of our family friends in this community. I think we had somewhere in the neighborhood of around 70 names. So um, we had some help from our river keepers putting a map together. And it was, it was a little shocking to see it. You know, it, it's, I, I still have a hard time looking at it. Technically, EPA has not regulated coal ash as a hazardous waste, but it is undeniable that coal ash contains many, many hazardous substances that are hazardous, in fact, to people and the environment. And the only reason they have not been regulated as such is because of intense lobbying efforts by coal industry and its allies. A lot of these chemicals are simple elements, but when you find them at the levels that they exist in around coal ash ponds, then you're starting to talk about cancer, brain tumors, you're talking about birth defects, developmental problems, uh, neurotoxicity. we began to look at legal options, cases that we could bring in court to protect communities and their citizens from these toxic leaking time bombs. In 2002, North Carolina enacted a public financing mechanism for judicial elections. This kept private money out of judicial elections. The repeal of the public financing program in judicial elections in North Carolina creates a dangerous precedent for all and it gives corporate polluters and other special interests the opportunity to elect the judges that they want. And this is important for us all. Everyone should care about this. Because when you think about the fact that the state and the federal government have basically abdicated their responsibility to regulate these issues, the state courts are the last stopgap. I think this is no longer a problem that's going to go under the radar. It has been exposed, and I am confident that we will ultimately, with the facts, win out and ensure that we have protected waterways. And so this is something that we all should care about. If we're worried about the water we drink and the air we breathe, we have to be concerned about money and judicial elections. So that's, that I really think is a powerful illustration of, of what's at stake when we talk about these issues. Um, and we released that video back in January, I think. Um, and Jacqueline, you've been in the state since then. And can you kind of tell us what's been happening with this coal ash issue in, in the last few months? Yeah, sure. So um, can, you, can you hear me okay? 
Can you hear me back there? Okay, great. So, um, so I have. Uh, so the NAACP has been working. Uh, unfortunately, a number of the the counties that the NAACP has branches in has have reported issues with coal ash and feeling powerless against the system to to regulate coal ash in North Carolina. So they called on the national office of the NAACP and the state office of the NAACP to come in and investigate what's been going on. And we just really kicked off those efforts, so I don't have much details to offer, but I have had, um, we, we went out and we had a number of conversations with the Stokes County NAACP and the uh, Goldsboro branch and had actually a town hall meeting where folks, similar to what we saw in the video, stood and one person actually stood and he showed, he had five funeral programs of family members who had passed from from um, from various illnesses prematurely, he felt, and he he just was calling for justice in terms of seeing not only his family but his um, but his community members um, passing away from these diseases. And we I also had gone out in the fall and met with a woman named Annie Brown who lived in the Blues Creek area, which is near one of the coal fire power plants. And she, like the person on the um, on the video, had collected the names of a number of people in her community who were sick and she had next to the names or she, she collected them over over time and she had next to the names a D next to the folks who had passed away. And then I was back in North Carolina a couple of months later showing um, a presentation from my findings from that trip. And when I showed her picture holding her notepad with the, with the names and the Ds next to them, there was a gasp from the audience and um, I asked what was going on and they said that she herself had passed away just six weeks before. So again, these are the stories that we're, we're seeing, that we're finding. And, and as they were saying in the video, that it's all somewhat anecdotal now because there isn't anyone doing actual studies around health surveillance, hospitalizations, and, and, and so forth, and looking at these patterns. And you know, besides the fact that the river keepers were, were kind of looking at the anecdotal data and mapping it out. So our next step is really to do an investigation around hospitalization rates and, and so forth, and really try to, 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 to discern and really document what the pattern is there. So, and we've seen you know some some advancements in terms of the fines to Duke in terms of other updates that are going on, and others might have more details on those on the fines. But those are some of the conversations we've been having. Thank you, Jackie. Sure. Um, I'm really glad to hear that you guys are doing that work in North Carolina too, as a North Carolina resident. Oh, um, yes. And I'd like to to kind of bring it back to the issue of money in judicial elections now, and I'd kind of like to back up and talk about. Um, what was happening whenever North Carolina enacted its public financing program in 2002? Uh, Professor Echeverria, you, um, you heard Bert mention yesterday that 2000 was a bit of a watershed year for money in judicial elections. Um, and it, we saw a lot more money um, than we had seen in previous years. And, and in the decade after that, we saw a ton of money. Um, and I was always kind of curious about you know, what happened that year in 2000. And then I read, um, a law review article that you wrote in 2001, where you kind of tried to describe what what was going on then. What did you What did you find? Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Well, uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, the great thing for me as a as a student of mine is in the audience, and uh, it's one thing to pontificate in a classroom, but to get the chance to come to Washington D.C. and to pontificate in front of my students gives me a kind of credibility that that is <laughs> is really wonderful. Um, I just wanted to mention one thing that that I I find interesting. Uh, first time member uh, of this group uh, meeting. And um, uh, I'm, I'm coming here as an environmentalist, longtime um, uh, employee of environmental groups, advocate for environmental causes. Um, and I'm, I'm struck uh, by the fact that there are not a whole lot of uh, fellow travelers in the room. There's some, but they're not a lot. Um, and I'm also struck by the fact that, um, that I view, in, in, in at least one fundamental way, judicial elections differently than, than other folks, or some other folks in the room. I think it was encapsulated by, by Professor Shepard when she, she said, judges are supposed to protect us from politicians. And that, and that, I think, is the agenda of a lot of people in the room. Uh, my agenda is, is actually different. It's to protect judges uh, from special interest advocates who want to persuade judges to ignore what the legislature has put into law and what, elect, and what elected officials, representatives, have put into regulations. So uh, I'm, I'm trying to, the work I've been doing has been trying to encourage the courts not to interfere with the judgment, judgments of elected officials. All those, all, all those of us who share a concern about judicial elections 
share a lot of common interests, but there, but there are some interesting differences in perspective. Um, Billy kindly introduced me by saying I've done all sorts of work in this area, and that's simply not true. Um, uh, I've done some work, and it's been very rewarding, but I'm, I've not uh, made a career of this. Um, uh, I've done two articles. Uh, one was done in 2001, uh, published in the NYU Environmental Law Journal. I'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, and then with the uh, encouragement and support of the Piper Fund, I did another report uh, uh, last year, which is published in the Vermont Journal of Environmental Law. This isn't in a nice bound version because the VGL Journal is entirely online. So they don't give you, I had to produce this paper version for my own personal use. Uh, you can find both of these on the iCloud that's, that is prepared for this conference. Um, so I have sort of a kind of an episodic involvement in this issue. Uh, and let me talk about what I did in, back in, in 2001. And I was trying to remember, wh how, why did I do this? You know, uh, why did I get involved in this issue? And for the life of me, I can't remember. Uh, uh, except I was the head of the Georgetown Environmental Law and Policy Institute. Uh, and, I had, uh, and, and our mission was to address um, uh, uh, developments, uh, issues, um, that were of general significance to the, to the direction of environmental protections in the United States. And I think in the course of that work, um, through um, anecdotes and media uh, uh, clips I picked up, I gained the impression that what was going on in the state courts and the state electoral process was of real significance or, or potentially great significance uh, for the future of environmental protection in the United States. And so uh, I dived into it. Uh, I had some very valuable uh, help from a researcher named a a Emily Hedden, um, support from the Environmental Working Group, um, and we put together a, a, this uh, article, which I frankly hadn't read in years, but I think uh, stands, stands up uh, the, the test of time and is really uh, provides you some insight into um, uh, into how we got to the situation we're at today. Um, you know, my wife has never read this article, neither of my children have read it, but you are the kind of nerds that I, I've been looking for uh, all my life. That's really um, good. So um, let me just very briefly um, uh, talk about what I, what I found. Um, and that is that in the um, 1996, 97, 98, um, there was kind of an explosion of activity uh, around the country focused on uh, state courts uh, and the electoral process uh, and a rise of conservative efforts uh, to influence the outcomes uh, of state court um, uh, elections, uh, presumably for the purpose of affecting the content uh, of state law on environmental issues and, and a host of other issues. One of the leaders in this um, was uh, uh, individuals who had uh, close affiliations with the Koch brothers, uh, former executives uh, in the Koch um, uh, enterprises, um, who organized, uh, uh, who helped, who were leaders in initiating this whole program. Um, so one of the efforts run out of Oklahoma uh, under the names of Citizens for Judicial Review or later the Economic Judicial Report, um, devised this idea of doing reviews of state court judges. Um, the idea was to sample the state court decisions in individual states uh, and then to rank the judges in terms of how business friendly they were or were not. Uh, so in the environmental arena, in this group would select 10 recent or relatively recent decisions from a state court. They very briefly describe the issues and then they'd say, with it, was the result good for business? In other words, the business party involved in the case or affected by the case, or was it not good? Not whether it was correctly decided, you know, whether it was well-reasoned, it was just, was the bottom line good for business? And the question was, if, 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 all, if, if it was not good for business, then it was a bad outcome, and then they looked at how the different members of the court voted, and then they tallied up the result, and then they published the results. Uh, and so if you were a judge in Ohio and you had voted for the business-friendly result, then you'd get a 100% rating. If you had voted on the environmental side, you'd get a 0% rating. Um, and this group um, basically launched a national effort. They wrote a fundraising letter uh, to business executives around the country who said, we're, we're trying to raise millions of dollars. Uh, we've developed this technique and we want to take it on the road. Uh, and they did raise millions of dollars and they did take it on the road. Um, the first uh, judicial survey that was ever published uh, 
was actually in the great state of Ohio uh, in 1996. Um, coincident with that, um, the Chamber of Commerce uh, created its Institute for Legal Reform. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce also adopted this survey technique uh, and in, in a sense created a bunch of farm teams uh, around the country to use um, this technique. Um, the third piece of this is the Americans, the ATRA, the what's American it? Tort Reform Association, Tort Reform Association uh, which was not so much focused on environmental issues but was concerned about tort liabilities, which of course could include environmental tort liabilities. Uh, and ATRA was also uh, became very active in supporting um, state level efforts to evaluate judges and counter uh, judges who are not uh, um, um, supportive of their interests. Um, to, to close, um, this effort uh, led to two big electoral battles in 2000 where environment really became very important. Uh, one was in, in Idaho uh, in var involving uh, Justice Kathy Silak, who was removed from the, the court in a very bitterly contested election uh, because of a vote uh, she cast in a, in a water uh, case in Idaho. Very controversial. Uh, business community went after her very hard. Um, Judge Resnick uh, in Ohio uh, was the target of a similar campaign uh, based in part on her vote uh, in an environmental case. Um, that effort uh, was unsuccessful. Um, but um, I, um, I, this is my audience, so I'm going to toot my own horn. If you're here, if you're bothered, if you bother to be here, you ought to take the time to read this article because it's frankly a fairly entertaining and interesting account of the growth uh, of this whole effort to uh, use this target of opportunity, cheap, low visibility state elections in order to move law and policy, uh, and how well organized and how coordinated uh, the corporate effort was to, to seize this opportunity. Thank you, Professor. Um, and I should say, um, you know, I think one thing that you mentioned in, in your article was that before this effort by big business, um, trial lawyers spend a lot of money in judicial elections. They really, it seems like in a lot of states, sort of had the game to themselves. Um, so it's not just big business doing this. I just want to point that out. Um, but you had mentioned Ohio a lot, Professor, and I want to ask um, Kathy, um, what's been happening in Ohio's judicial elections um, since the, the time that the professor was talking about? So it's funny, um, so, uh, uh, we talk about tort reform, and so during, during the late 90s, there were two different things that were decided. One was for three times, our educational system was declared unconstitutional, and the author was Alice Roby Resnick. And the second thing is Alice Roby Resnick wrote a decision basically stopping a tort reform bill. So, so uh, the Chamber of Commerce um, created uh, the Citizens for a Strong Ohio, uh, which, like many affiliates, um, uh, basically did the Chamber's dirty work and um, spent a lot of money um, basically going after her. So did the U.S. Chamber at that time. As, you know, as the professor said, it was unsuccessful but they really learned from their mistakes there. And so I think what they learned first off is if they're open, you know, they, t they tackled open seat races. You know, like if you do open seats, you, you do kind of introductory thing, you can do more positive ads. Um, also, um, once they got these folks in, the, once they got the, the more um, pro-business uh, conservative judges in, then all they had to do was support them. And so the court that was in, in, you know, up until the early aughts was um, dominated by Democrats, now, now uh, it's seven members, um, now has one Democrat, well, and one Paul Pfeiffer. So you might say to yourself, who is Paul Pfeiffer? Paul Pfeiffer, uh, is, um, he was a Senate president and um, a very conservative guy, but very reasonable. Uh, he has a farm in Bucyrus, which is just, just north of, of Columbus. And this is what he said in 2006. I never felt so much like a hooker down by the bus station as I did in a judicial race. Everyone interested in contributing has specific interests. That means they're trying to buy my vote. Okay, so that's 2006. So um, would you like me to forward a little or do you want me to hand it back to you? Um, no, go ahead. So, so the Chamber of Commerce's affiliate, they changed their name too, that was the other thing they learned, apparently don't, call, don't keep your, your Citizens for a Strong Ohio, um, uh, get rid of that one and come up with another name, and so they've changed their name a couple different times. But the thing that is 
interesting as you look at um, their advancement of a pro-business court is they give even if it looks like there's not actually going to be a fight. Um, I did want to highlight a guy named Bill O'Neill who ran a couple times for the Supreme Court. He's the one Democrat. Now he refused to raise any money and in fact, uh, and in fact he basically he got in uh, spending $5,000 of his own money to become a justice. Now you might say, oh, what the heck was going on? That the, um, it was, it's not actually clear what was going on there, but I do believe that um, Bill's uh, likability made a difference, and I also think that there was a mistake that was made in the opponent's ad where they basically suggested that he was a friend of child molesters, which was, was really, uh, like to mo so, so like it would just over the top enough that people who know that you know Bill O'Neill is a sweet guy who was a judge, judge, but before that he was a nurse and he was in Vietnam and just that that sense of like the unfairness of that, much the way they had that unfairness in 2000, was enough to kind of push things over and the bar association, for example, coming to his defense, etc. Right. Yeah, I, I mean, I think. Yeah, we've seen that in a lot mm -hmm. of states, that kind of backlash over a really mm -hmm. nasty ad. We, and we saw that ad earlier. It was, it was pretty disgusting. Um, so, Chris, I want to talk to you a little about, um, you know, we saw this money come in in 2000, and that included it in North Carolina. They saw $2 million, I think, in their 2000 Supreme Court election, which was a record. Um, and then what did the legislature do about it? Well, yeah, in North Carolina, as many of you know, it's a really cautionary tale and symbolic story about how a state can be, go from being a beacon of light for election reform and good government reform to a case study in the power and undue influence that big money can have in shifting a state around. And around 2000, that's where you saw two things really coming together at the same time, which is one, on one hand, growing influence in courts, money flooding in, and there was kind of a series of corporate scandals. One of the ones we investigated at the Institute with corporate hog farms, uh, which had been polluting a lot of eastern North Carolina, and there had been an injunction to stop the building of those farms, and issues like that were going to court. At the same time, you had this growing good government, clean elections movement, one of the most successful in the country and definitely in the South, uh, which formed North Carolina Voters for Clean Elections, which we're a member of. Uh, and in 2002, this all came together with bipartisan support. And I really want to underscore the word bipartisan because it truly was a bipartisan effort to pass the Judicial Campaign Reform Act. And it had a bunch of provisions. It made uh, judicial races nonpartisan. It lowered the amount that could be donated to judicial campaigns. Uh, it had a voter guide so that it, people actually felt like they understood where these judges were coming from. But the crown jewel of that act was public financing. And there was an ad, which uh, we had to show again uh, when public financing came under attack more recently, of a Republican and a Democratic governor walking towards the camera saying, we don't agree on much, but one thing we agree on is that money shouldn't be in our courts, and that's why we support this. And it really gave a flavor of the time where there was bipartisan support for this kind of legislation. And it immediately took off. Over the course of its 10-year career, uh, judicial public financing was used by 80% of the judges who qualified, and this wasn't free money, right? You had, it was sweat equity, you had to go out and get small donors, and then you'd get a grant, so it wasn't just taxpayer-funded elections. It was a grant after you'd gotten that small donor support. And a number of accomplishments, right? That it did almost everything that we hoped it would do. It drove down drastically the amount of special interest money that came, was flooding into elections. It diversified the bench, right? It, the, whether or not you could run for office didn't depend on the size of your wallet, dramatically increasing the number of women, African American judges in the state. Uh, and it just made, uh, by all accounts, uh, and especially on a lot of issues, and the, part of the research uh, that he was talking about was about environmental issues, just a sense of this being a responsive court, too. Um, so to bring it to the current, though, it's in 2010, uh, when we had a big flip in the political direction of the state. Uh, oh, and I should just say, in 2002, there was one voice of opposition uh, on the floor of the legislature, and his name was Art Pope. So let's remember that name as we go forward 10 years, the 10-year success of this program. And it was in 2010 when there was a flip in the legislature. All of a sudden, we started seeing these ads for Americans for Prosperity, others attacking this idea of clean elections. And then that really was kind of being ramped up. And we're like, wow, this is a real big target. 
Uh, and then when Governor M Pat McCrory was elected, uh, he first thing he did was appoint Art Pope as his state budget director. And the first thing Art Pope did as budget director in the very first budget he released was zero out funding for the judicial public financing program. This was a budget that a lot of other people were afraid he's gonna be slashing all these programs. Actually pretty moderate on a lot of fronts, but judicial public financing had to go. But if you remember, there was that depth of support, bipartisan support. The judges liked it, a lot of the public liked it. Uh, we could get Republicans from other states like West Virginia coming down to say, support this kind of legislation. So there's bipartisan support. And that led to this compromise idea that, well, at least let's try to compromise, let's hold it on for just a few more years, we'll sunset some of the funding, but allow it to just go on for a little bit longer. And then there was this kind of Sopranos moment where Art Pope shows up on the floor of the legislature, some arms are turned, uh, and we broke the story that he had this conversation with the guy, a Republican, uh, who had sponsored this compromise, and before we knew it, the compromise was dead, and along with it went judicial public financing. And I think it really drove home. This was a guy who had received money from Pope's political machinery uh, to get elected, and it really just drove home the big money influence. Our line was, uh, he wants Pope-funded elections, not publicly-funded elections. And it really, uh, we were able to generate some good national attention about just kind of what a naked power grab this was and how it was the very problem we were talking about, the influence of big money that could lead to the end of what was such a successful clean election reform in North Carolina. Thanks, Chris. Um, and Professor, you mentioned the article that you wrote last year. Um, and you, in that article, you examined uh, state Supreme Courts in North Carolina, Montana, Wisconsin, and Washington State. Um, and you looked at what's been happening in North Carolina um, in the most recent election um, without public financing. Can you tell us um, a little bit about that report briefly? Sure. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the Piper Fund approached me and said, um, you, you seem to be one of the few people in America who's, who's written intensively about the environmental um, state of environmental law and judicial elections. How would you like to update that research and find out what's happened since then and, and whether all this uh, activity uh, surrounding state judicial elections has had an impact uh, on the content uh, of environmental law. So I dug back uh, into this arena and I discovered that um, uh, things had gone from bad to worse. Um, the evaluation strategy seemed to have sort of gone by the wayside, um, but the amount of money uh, involved had certainly increased, and the amount of money um, spent by outside sources, as, as Professor Shepard explained, had, had increased. Um, I, I think I also uh, quickly observed that just as in Congress, uh, environmental issues have become uh, a, a, a partisan uh, point of, of disagreement, uh, similarly on the, uh, on the state courts, uh, that one can predict with a, with a uh, sad regularity uh, how justices will vote uh, depending on their uh, uh, formal or, or nominal or apparent uh, party uh, affiliations. Um, so, so my task in, in undertaking this research um, uh, was to try to figure out whether uh, the, the, acti the, uh, the agitation, the advocacy surrounding judicial elections changed the, the, the makeup of who's on the courts and whether that in turn affects the content of environmental law. Um, and let me just say at the outset that, that uh, I could have used that, that, that good education and statistical methods uh, from Professor Shepard because this is a, a daunting uh, sort of methodological challenge. Um, one of the, the fundamental uh, uh, questions is, is what is environmental law? Um, because in the state courts deal with a wide variety of cases. Uh, they deal with local land use issues. They do, deal with tort cases. They deal with cases involving the, imp the local implementation of federal environmental laws. They deal with um, uh, disputes of, uh, between holders of water rights. They deal with issues arising from state agency implementation of state laws, a wide variety of things. And how do you define the universe of environmental law cases you're going to be looking at? I used a very dumb and simplistic method which is for the lawyers in the room, I went to the Westlaw keynote system and I looked for the cases that, in whatever mysterious method they used, the Westlaw keynote uh, organizers had, had used to identify the environmental law cases in that jurisdiction. Whatever method they used, they must have used it with a fair regularity across the country. So using that, I was able to identify the cases. Um, 
it's also hard to, to approach these cases and say, I'm trying to look for cases that uh, were influenced, and in a sense, improperly influenced by political leanings. And you, you obviously can't reach the conclusion that somebody voted against the, uh, the environmental side and they did that for some improper reason because environmental advocates sometimes bring uh, very weak cases that should lose uh, based on precedent in the law. Industry brings cases challenging environmental law that are meritorious and should prevail. Uh, and so you can't simply make a judgment uh, as I criticized the old survey methods that were used in the late 1990s as applying a kind of who wins analysis. Well, that's obviously not the kind of analysis I wanted to apply. Uh, but what I did try to do is collect a large enough number of cases uh, and then say, well, how did people vote here? Uh, and how did the court come out? Uh, and the idea was that if you looked at a large number of cases, not individual cases, but a large sampling of cases, and you tried to detect patterns and figure out whether people consistently voted with or without the, the support of their peers on one side or another of the issue, that that would uh, in, provide some indication uh, of, the, of ideological um, leanings. Um, the other complicating factor is that, that not every uh, Supreme, so the Supreme Court jurisdictions across the country vary. Some Supreme Courts uh, accept uh, every case that's presented to them from the lower courts. Some exercise discretionary jurisdiction. Um, and that obviously has an, has an uh, impact. So let me just um, very quickly um, mention the, the, the results I, I came up upon. Um, it turns out that, that if you are interested in environmental issues and you're looking for the state court for help, it makes a whole lot of difference what state you live in. Um, sadly, in the state of North Carolina, and I came up with a memorable phrase that some of the media picked up, uh, North Carolina Sup Supreme Court is the sinkhole for environmental law. Uh, in the period of 15 years that I looked at, I couldn't find a decision from the state Supreme Court that had come down on the environmental side of the issue. Um, they just consistently voted against the environmental side, either the environmental advocates or the governments in a contest uh, with industry. There were some dissents, there were some disagreements, there were some nuances, uh, but the results were all consistently bad. Um, Washington State, um, quite a different situation. Um, there, um, I found, at the end of the day, uh, 20 cases um, that had a, a clear pro or, or negative environmental implication in terms of their outcome, and the results were 10-10. 10 on the environmental side, 10 on the anti-environmental side, or the non, not supportive of the environmental outcome, uh, which struck me as the, the result you would hope for uh, from a balanced court. Um, I looked at Wisconsin, about 15 cases in my sample, um, and this is a, a, a kind of a, um, a, a distinctive uh, institution because the apparent partisan control of the court shifted over the period I was looking. So it was controlled by Republicans, then controlled for about five years by Democrats, and then it was controlled by Republicans. And with, with one case that was an outlier, the results of the environmental cases flipped depending on which party was in control. So when the Republicans were in control, the environmentalists lost. When the Democrats gained control, the, the environmentalists won. And then finally, when the Republicans gained, regained control, the environmentalists uh, resumed the pattern of losing. Um, finally, uh, Montana. Uh, and Montana is a, is a sort of a unique case because Montana has, in its state constitution, a right to a clean and healthy environment. Uh, that's virtually unique uh, across the country. And so actions affecting the environment are subject to strict scrutiny in the state of Montana. Um, so it's an entire, in, in a sense, it's an entirely different legal regime in which as a matter of their fundamental constitutional law, Montanans have put the environment on a different plane than other jurisdictions. Consistent with that, um, the state of Montana, the results are consistently more favorable to the environment than in any of the jurisdictions I looked at, although recently there's been a good deal of, of uh, uh, partisan and ideological political activity surrounding the courts, and the results are recently a good deal more mixed. So what is the conclusion I draw from all that? And this is, topic is certainly worthy of, of, of more sophisticated, more in-depth research, is yes, and, and you know, the one response to this would be, duh, what did you think? You, know, you thought they were spending all this money for no good purpose. The, re the reality is they were spending all this money and it was for good purpose. Uh, and, and how much 
energy and effort and money goes into judicial elections affects the makeup of the court and it affects the bottom line in terms of the decisions that are rendered by those courts. Thank you. Um, and I've got one last question for Catherine, and then I want to go down the line and ask everyone their kind of concluding thoughts about how we should deal with these problems, how we can fix these problems. Um, and Catherine, you wrote an op-ed recently about a specific Ohio Supreme Court case and some conflicts of interest um, that were involved with the judges there. Can you briefly tell us about that? So we are very blessed um, with two outspoken justices about the problem of money in politics. So I mentioned Paul Pfeiffer, who, um, as the court got more conservative, he somehow appears to be a Democrat, and they don't even run Democrats against him. But there's also a guy named Bill O'Neill that I mentioned. And he is um, very eloquent. And this is what he said on the completion of a case that was uh, basically what happened is this, this small village, and it's up in Northeast Ohio, Mumford Falls is the name of it. Um, they, ha they you know, had a community that collected signatures to put on the ballot that um, they would ban fracking in their community. That you just could, you know, you know a zoning kind of thing, like you wouldn't permit the, uh, there to be um, fracking in the community. What happens is um, Beck Energy came in, basically said, well, we don't have to listen to you. We're actually going to drill anyway. They purchased some proper, you know, property, got a lease, and were able to actually do the drilling despite the fact that Mumford Falls had this you know, ordinance that said you can't do it. They said basically because it's up to the state, right? So the state gets to actually decide. What happened is it worked its way to the Supreme Court. Now, we live in a home rule state, and what that means is basically you get to, you know, there's, there's a priority given to like local jurisdictions making decisions for themselves. You know, that whole notion that you, that you should be able to um, make decisions about how you zone, and it's not up to the state to make those decisions. Uh, but it worked its way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said that, hey, um, in this case, the state rules, the state, in fact, makes these decisions. And Justice O'Neill said, what the drilling industry has bought and paid for in campaign contributions, they shall receive. That was in his dissent. Uh, so we have Paul Pfeiffer, who's uh, highlighting the problems with the system. Um, Bill O'Neill highlighting the problems with the fracking industry actually giving you know, tremendous contributions um, to both uh, the party, to other elected officials. Um, the justice who uh, wrote the decision uh, received $8,000 um, from frackers, for example. Now, I thought this was, this was helpful also to provide context. You know, I've given lots of quotes here, but this, this guy, his name is Sean Bennett from the Ohio Oil and Gas Association, and I included this. He basically said, Ohio's oil and gas industry is no different than any other industry or business in supporting legislators who understand the issues and want to pursue sound policy. It just so happens Ohio is blessed with lots of good and thoughtful officers. That was his response to this case. I also like to highlight this from uh, last year, just right before the election, it's October 25th. This is Judy French, uh, who wrote the decision. She said, I'm a Republican, and you should vote for me. You're going to hear from your elected officials and see a lot of them in the crowd. Let me tell you something. The Supreme Court is the backstop for all. All those votes you are going to cast. Whatever the governor does, whatever the state senate does, whatever your state rep does, whatever they do, we are the ones who decide if it's constitutional. We decide if it's lawful. We decide how to implement any given case. So forget all those other votes if you don't keep the Supreme Court conservative. I think that says it all. Um, thanks, Kathy. Um, we're really running short on time, but I want to go back to you, Jackie. Um, we've heard a lot about the influence that these fossil fuel industries have in our government, including our courts. So what are citizens supposed to do to make sure that their governments are protecting their air and water? How do we, how do we take action? Yeah, so, so we really have to, because it's such a, a comprehensive problem with, um, with all of these 
tentacles, we really have to have a comprehensive approach in dealing with it. So we work on everything from getting money out of politics um, and out of our, our out of our courts, um, work, including campaign finance reform and so and other um, policies of that sort. We also work on voting rights. We know that the same folks who are polluting our communities are the same folks that are working systematically on stripping voting rights. So that's an inc a critical because these same communities that are polluted are the ones whose voting rights are being stripped. So we need to make sure that, that folks are, are true participants in the democracy. Then we also work on ensuring, on, on really advocating for, one of the things we didn't get into with a lot of um, specificity is if you look even at the permits and the types of, um, the types of uh, pollutants that are, are supposed to be monitored, you see blank spaces where, where these pollutants are supposed to be monitored. And we have, there's no groundwater, groundwater monitoring, there's no regulations around caps or lining, liners around this coal ash. So we are working hard to advocate for those types of provisions so that we actually have those policies in place. And then actually with this, this situation in North Carolina, we are moving forward with um, considering litigation in this context as well. So those are the types of um, citizens' tools that we're using. Mm, thank you. Um, and Chris, can you briefly sort of tell us what's going on with reform efforts in North Carolina right now in terms of judicial elections? Sure thing. And so I told you about the demise of uh, public financing, and just I realized I didn't say a lot about Art Pope. He was a chairman of Americans for Prosperity, kind of the Koch brothers' right hand man, had a big political influence machine, and he worked for Governor McCrory. Uh, so working for Americans for Prosperity, you kind of know working with Koch Industries, he had energy interests at heart. Also, there was just a lot of outside money that came in and a lot of uh, Center for American Progress, and we've documented all the outside money that came into about $2 million worth into judicial elections in the last, uh, in 2014, and uh, just a host of energy interests. And that's where it gets into those difficulty around those recusal uh, issues, right? Because it's always through second or third or fourth hand that that money ends up from Duke Energy or a lot of these other Piedmont natural gas, all these that have a stake in these decisions are going to be made by the courts, but working its way through 527s uh, and other groups in D.C. and then making their way back down to North Carolina. So those are the kind of issues we're dealing with. Just had a really interesting thing happen in the last, uh, in this legislative session, where after all that money came in and after the legislature had pushed so hard to demolish these clean election reforms for judges, suddenly they claim to have uh, discovered the importance of uh, the corrupting influence of money in elections and abruptly decided to go to a retention system uh, for this. There's only one uh, judge that's up for re-election, <laughs> and it happens to be a Republican judge, a sitting judge, uh, in 2016. And so this uh, bill was called the Bob Edmonds Protection Act because it basically means that he won't have to go up uh, for an election and face all these uh, corrupting influence. But there's still at the uh, the, uh, the court level, court of appeals, those are still going to have elections. It'll be interesting to watch to see if money goes down uh, to that level and other levels where uh, money could still play a big role. Uh, but that little latest twist is going to be interesting uh, to follow because it kind of took out a play uh, at least in the next year, but that could all change uh, the Supreme Court level uh, elections. But what is interesting, given the court that we have now, uh, the there was a backlash against, and I just want to end on that note, that there was this backlash against all this money. Candidates uh, talked about just how humiliating it was to have to dial for dollars instead of going out and talking to people about the issues they cared about, and instead were forced to hole up in their rooms and raise $4 million worth for their campaigns instead of the judicial campaign program. And the one who was, was the target of the most attacks, and this is similar to the stories you hear from Ohio and other places, Robin Hudson, who also was accused of being soft on child molesters, that seems to be a common theme, uh, at her swearing-in ceremony in January, used her entire speech to talk about this dangerous crossroads for courts and says we mu all must keep sending the message that our citizens de declared this year that North Carolina's courts are not for sale. And three of the people who've been the staunchest advocates of public financing uh, and also happened to be progressive members of the court won. Uh, last year and really spoke out about their continued belief uh, that courts needed to be independent and then in the future they're going to continue to fight for reforms that would keep courts fair and independent. Thanks, Chris. Um, and now we have some time for Q&A. I don't know if um, anyone has written down a question or if you just want to raise your hands, we could, uh, we could go around if anyone has any questions. If not, I have more questions. <laughs> 
I, I should have mentioned that I, I uh, exploited that data extensively and oh, yeah. found it enormously valuable. And Follow, followthemoney.org. I like that. It's a great resource. And we also have one in North Carolina, Follow and See Money, which is, uh, that was an inspiration for some of the work we've done as well. Yeah. Alex? Yeah, so yes to all of you. So in terms of the litigation, it's really, the litigation that we're planning is really just getting started. We, on last month, we announced that we're going to move forward with that. So now we're doing the data collection and, and so forth to, to, um, to advance that. And the second question, uh, second part of your question. Yeah, I was just, I was just wondering, like, Well, if the media is any, is any indication, definitely they, they picked up on the connection between McCrory having worked for Duke and the, um, how this, this whole situation was very light on Duke as it relates to the coal ash spill that happened in Danville. So that was really, you know, I would say where that messaging was most prominent. I, yeah, I, I would agree with that too. I mean, we're, we're doing what we can to, to draw those links in the public's mind. I do think that the coal ash issue it, itself has gotten, um, is really resonating with people right now. Um, you know, we had Duke um, agree to start providing drinking water to some of these communities after refusing to do so for a long time. Um, and to me, that just sort of seemed like a, an admittance on their part that, you know, that they were causing pollution. Um, so I think that's, that's really helping to, to alert people to what's going on here. One of the, uh, one of the things that I, I don't, I'm not here speaking on behalf of the environmental community. I'm just a, just a professor observing and writing down what I find. But I think the, the environmental community is, is sort of, um, based on its actions, a little conflicted about this whole topic. In, in a sense, they're, they're the bullseye of a lot of this political advocacy. The, the Koch brothers, when I did my research a couple of years ago, were distinguished by the fact that they, they received the largest EPA environmental fine in the history of the agency, and they have all sorts of environmental problems and are opposed to all, all manner of environmental regulations. And so, in a sense, a lot of this work at the, at the state courts uh, seems very targeted at environmental regulation, and a lot of the contests involve environmental regulation. and. And Justice Hudson, who's the alleged child molester, was actually the best environmental vote on the North Carolina Supreme Court. Not that it mattered, because she was always in dissent, but you know, I don't think of her as a child molester. I think of her as, as somebody with moderate sympathies for, for environmental law. So, so the question for environmentalists is, is do, you, do, you, do you fight or flee? Do, do you jump into these electoral contests? And do you uh, advocate for your candidates? Do you support your candidates? And do you oppose uh, the candidates on the other side who you think will not benefit the environment? Uh, or do you advocate for merit selection and for fair and impartial courts? Are you, are you part of the, or you, and the problem obviously is if you jump into the electoral process, you become part of the problem. Uh, and I think if you look at some of the ads that ran in Montana, which were financed in part by green dollars attacking Lawrence Van Dyke, you would say, wow, that's pretty hard hitting. Um, um, money in politics affecting judicial races. Um, but the environmentalists thought this was somebody who was, who was running against somebody who'd been reasonable on the environment, who was not going to be favorable to the environment, and they were not going to you know, engage in a conversation about um, you know, merit selection in the, in the great by and by. They were going to get in the trenches and they were going to fight in that electoral contest. Um, so I don't know, you know it's, I think it's a real question about how the environmental community fits into this conversation, because I think they're obviously concerned about money and politics and, and Citizens United and, and would like to see cleaner state judicial elections, um, but they can't wait for that moment to arrive. And just real quick to end, uh, you can have the last word, Kathy. Um, you could just sort of tell us what's going on right now in terms of the conversation about reforming judicial elections in Ohio. Um, and 
just sort of tell us, um, you know, do you think people in Ohio are aware of this problem? How do we make them aware if, if they're not? So one of the things that um, is, is very sad about Ohio, of course, is, is you know, I can give you kind of the, this 15-year history of um, two steps forward, one step back, two step forwards, one step back. And right now, I would say that folks are really regrouping. I do know that, um, that we um, have folks that are really committed, for example, the Food and Water Watch and um, Ohio Citizen Action. There, there are groups that are saying to themselves, okay, maybe, maybe what we need is A, better disclosure, B, recusal, you know, recusal standards. If we can't seem to get recusal standards because, you know, based on campaign contributions, et cetera, if we can't seem to get that, what about merit selection? So we're starting these conversations again. Um, we had a wonderful champion um, who passed away, our, our former Chief Justice, who was really pushing for merit selection. And um, when he passed and things transitioned, that interest, um, all of a sudden the bar pulled back, all of a sudden a lot of the groups that were kind of on board um, stood back uh, and those voices that were really in opposition um, took over. So we are regrouping uh, and trying to figure out what our next steps are um, in much the same way as I imagine, you know, you're continuing your fight. It, it does feel like a slog. Mm. Yeah. And we need your help. So if you have suggestions, uh, let me know. <laughs> well, let's have a hand for our panel. This has been really great.